I'm really excited about this this new locking mechanism and all the complaints I have about the triad lock and the scorpion lock have now been solved with the newest one. So Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, and welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from TheKnifeJunkie.com. Welcome to episode number 20 of the Knife Junkie Podcast, another great interview coming up on this show. And uh, Bob, another chance for you to talk to uh, one of the folks in the knife world that you uh, just, I don't know if I, if the word idolize is the one I want to use, but uh, that you've been looking forward to chatting. Jim, I think idolize is a weak word for this one. Uh, <laughs> having recently gotten the Cold Steel AD10 and AD15, I was re-reminded of how you know incredible uh, a knife maker and designer Andrew Demko is. I reached out to him. What a great guy! Yeah, he came on the show. We had a great conversation. Just to remind you that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audible.com/slash knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, go to audibletrial.com slash knife junkie. You know you're a knife junkie if you're as happy as a kid on Christmas morning when that new knife arrives in the mail. To knife folks, today's guest needs no introduction. He came to widespread attention in 2006, or at least to my attention in 2006, when his innovation, the Triad Lock, was at the center of a Cold Steel rebranding. And now, 13 years later or so, Andrew Demko, who has a thriving custom knife career, has released high-fidelity production versions of two of his most popular custom knives, both employing super strong locks of his own invention. Andrew, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. It's great to have you. I I have to tell you, uh, first, before we start off, my older brother, Vic, wanted me to pass along to you how incredibly kick-ass he thinks your knives are. (laughs) (laughs) Great. There you go. Thank you. There's your shout out, Vic. Okay. uh, I like to break the ice every time we have one of these interviews with a pocket check. So tell me, Andrew, what are you carrying today? Well, that's a good question. Typically, uh, every day I carry an AD-15, but also I'm always tinkering with different locking mechanisms. So I usually have at least one other kind of prototype in my pocket that I play with, you know, the whole way to work and at stoplights and stuff and just, you know, kind of falling in love with uh, new projects. Right, right. So you're innovating another, a, a third lock we can expect to see sometime soon then. Yes, hopefully. Awesome. Well, tell me, Andrew, what got you into making knives and did you always know you wanted to make a career of it? You know, I was a knife nut ever since I was a kid. And um, my family has a, had a martial arts school, has a martial arts school. And I always wanted swords. And my dad was like, well, I'll buy you a sword set if you could get on the honor roll. Luckily for him, I was too stupid to ever, uh, or, or a bad student to get on the honor roll. So I, I never, I never got that sword set. Uh, they would have bought it for me, but just couldn't, couldn't handle this, the, the elementary school grades. So, uh, and then in seventh grade, we had metal shop and we forged chisels. And I was like, Oh my goodness. I can't believe this is all you have to do is heat hammer and heat treat and quench. I said, I'll show him. And so I started making kind of swords and knives and stuff that. And that's how it really started. So did you think back then when you were just trying to get a sword for yourself, did you think this would be a career? No, I didn't think that until I was a bit older. By by about 16 or 17 years old, I kind of was realizing, you know, through Blade Magazine that guys were making knives that were pretty expensive and that you could probably make a living making knives. And uh, that's kind of when the bug really started for me. So what were your first knives like and how did you come to, I I don't know if this is an accurate statement, but it seems like you specialize in folders. How did you get yourself to that specialization and what were your first knives like? The first knives I made were liar locks and uh, and then of course frame locks. And I really hated making frame locks. Why is that? Well, I, I have a special dislike for frame locks because I had such problems making them throughout my early career. Uh, and you know, the, the cons to frame locks are, it's a expensive piece of titanium that typically when you make your, you know, you're cutting your lock bar and stuff and one little mess up and bang, your, your, either your blade's not working or your, 
your, I call it your liner, but it's your frame is not working. And then pretty soon you're making a second blade for the first frame and the second frame for the first blade. And, uh, it was just like, man, I just, I didn't like it. Um, and I felt a lot. It was, it was the, it was the failure that, that kind of led me to try to do something else. Interesting. Necessity being the mother of invention. So you, you said uh, you just expressed a, a dislike for frame locks. And uh, it makes me wonder, uh, is that does that have anything to do with the video you did a couple of years ago with the Sabenza? You know, it was the test between the triad and the Sabenza? Uh, no, that, you know, all those tests reinforced my um, my ill opinion of frame locks because I find of all the knife locks, they tend to be the most unreliable. Oftentimes they're really strong and really good, but sometimes the same exact frame lock from the same maker will, the lock will slip and it's just, I just find them unreliable. Now there are some awesome frame lock makers out there. Don't get me wrong. And I've, I've made some frame locks. In fact, I recently made, well, a few years ago, I made a couple just for fun. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I really much prefer a liner lock than the frame lock, actually. Is that because um, the handle is uh, fully encases the lock and there's no um, kind of messing with it with your hand once you're gripping it? Well, typically, I, I find that a, a liner lock, typically, to me, tends to be more durable than the frame lock because the frame lock, the leaf spring, the frame spring, whatever you call that, is so stiff and so strong that it basically, it doesn't roll with the punches. Like, if you start on the liner lock, and you start to try to, to flex it down and vice it, you'll see that leaf spring. I, I'm talking with my hands and look at this thing. I know you guys can't see me, but it works. You'll see that spring, that leaf spring. Even you'll see this on the Spyderco police model you'll, or the military. Uh -huh. You'll see the spring deform. It'll flex the way it's supposed to. When you release the pressure, it unflexes and, and it still feels good. But the frame lock, since the lock, locks are so stiff and so strong, they don't really absorb any of that force and what happens is the lock faces tend to deform and then with the same amount of force you might get up and down play in your in your knife because it wasn't you know it's like that old story where the oak tree is so strong but the heavy snow broke it but then the pine tree same type of deal there however since the uh, popularity of the lock inserts these still inserts they put on the lock the uh, frame now that definitely helps a lot but the damage has been done for me yeah so do you think adding the uh adding the um the stainless steel insert allows knife makers to get a little sloppy with their fit? No, I don't think it's it's a matter of that, but it's really weird because it used to be that you had to do titanium because the whole idea of titanium as you probably know it galls so it would stick to the frames. And that's how they they wouldn't slip out. You know, that blade tang angle on the frame might be 7 or 8 or 9 degrees. The more angle it is, the more ability you have for the, the knife would deform and it to continue over and self adjust as a steep, steep arc or flat arc or, you know, recess arc on the lock face. And, um, they said, they always said, oh, you have to use titanium. You can't use steel. And then people would use steel. Eventually somebody came out and they carbonized the, either the lock faces of the, the blade tang or the, the steel leaf that help it kind of bite together. But, you know, Terzuela, Bob Terzuela, if I say his name right, I don't apologize if I didn't. He kind of does, as you know, the recess, the, the concave lock face, and that helps a lot too. Actually, when I do make liner locks, that's how I do them with that. With uh, the concave? Yes, that absolutely is, is the way to go. I mean, that's interesting because most consumers bristle at the thought of lock stick, you know, titanium, soft titanium up against uh, stainless steel, and then it, it sticks when you, when you unlock it. And people, you know, really get wrapped around the axle about that, myself included. But it sounds like uh, that was the original intention of using a softer material is, is to get yes. it so that it's not so slippery. Right. The dissimilar materials are supposed to work that way. This with hard steel and titanium. But yeah, and then they stick too much. And then, like, you know, if a frame lock doesn't, or a lock, if it doesn't have that bite, you feel like it's going to slip out. Or, you know, if it's, you know, quote unquote, early lockup, which is kind of the dumbest thing in the world. Early lockup, it's, it's going to early fail on you because it's hardly on there. I've tested a lot of knives. Exactly. Believe me. I, I, you know, that it's so intuitive that it's almost counterintuitive. <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, if it's barely on there. You know, I think the original intention was, well, if the timing is early on the lock, it will eventually work its way in and you'll have like really good solid timing once the knife is broken. But but if you add the, the lock bar insert, 
it never has the chance to do it. It's going to stay early forever. <laughs> right, right. Uh, the early lockup, you're right, though. It's, it's, it's definitely better than late lockup, I guess. But you don't, you know, you have to watch that. Yeah. Um, and I, I, we've tested some, and I made some, you know, with with the early lockup years ago. And when I would do weight hang tests, the on frame locks with early lockup, the tang would shear right through, just cut right through the uh, that tiny, the, the leaf, the titanium leaf where it made it up. So I said, well, early lockup, no good. Yeah. In fact, I would use, I would take my frame locks that were say one fifty thou thick, hundred fifty thousandths, and I would machine down the face so it was only seventy five thousandths thick. So you can imagine it had the thick leaf mm-hmm. and then stepped down. And then so the whole entire lock face of the, the, the leaf was on the blade tang. And that way there was no opportunity for it to just shear it and push it away. It would, it would stay on and flex. Right, right. Well, uh, since we're talking about locks, what inspired you to endeavor to make the strongest lock in the business? Uh, you know, the triad lock is what I'm referring to. And what was the process? Well, you know, at the time when I did that, I was... Um, I was doing like freelance work for Cold Steel. I was um, kind of making some samples and prototypes. And I was uh, an electrician. I was an apprentice at the time. And I would come home at nights and uh, work on the, on the locks. And um, then I, I kind of started paying attention to how strong the lockbacks were. And I was like, wow, these are, these are really strong for being plastic candles and stuff. But at that time, I was still making heavy-duty frame locks or liner locks. And, um, that's when I had the idea, because as you know, most at that time, there was, there wasn't a lot of guys making, uh, you know how the, the locks, a lot of times now with flippers, they have a, the integral stop pin that's in the blade tang, mm-hmm. where it's like a half cut out and it spins around. Yeah. And, um, it was always an exposed stop pin. And then, so with the frame locks, you know, you have a stop pin and your leaf spring. And then I thought, wow, that stop pin does a lot of work. You know, when you flick the blade open and you chop with it, do whatever you're going to do, the stop pin absorbs all that. And I knew what the lockbacks, the, the failure there typically is. The blade is beating up the rocker, the locking bar, the lock rocker the whole time. So I thought, wow, if you could add that stop pin into it, it would it would probably improve the lockback. And so that's why I made my first ones. I, I took cold steel ones and I added the stop pin. And uh, they were pretty good. But then I started thinking about undercut angles and things like that that would really help the uh, the rocker bar stay in the blade tank. So that's that's how that went. You built in a, a tolerance so that it it will over time sink deeper and deeper into the into that notch, is it, right? That's right. There, that the uh, blade tang is it's like um it's wedge shaped. So as it falls deeper, it goes down in. It it will get tighter or it will, it will take up wear that way. That's why there's tolerance in the bottom, and it's even though there, there's a the inside where it locks up to the blade tang is a, is a straight line, and the part that locks up to the stop pin is a, is an arc. But they're actually angled to each other so that they actually make a, a wedge shape and, and wedge down in. Nice. And then the slot in the rocker allows it to the 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 rocker to sink down and backward as the front arc pushes it back. And that's how it all locks up and resists impact. That must have been a hell of a trial and error process, kind of coming up with that geometry. Um, the strength of the triad lock, I, I had always assumed that I, I don't know why I just made this story up in my head, but I just assumed. Um, you know, being a Cold Steel fan since I got my first Tanto in 1984, and they, you know, they're always making claims about their strength and sharpness, which is scientifically backed with their proof videos and anecdotally by bro science, like in backyards, like I have done. Um, I was assuming that Lynn Thompson gravitated to you and the triad lock because of the strength of it. I thought, I thought perhaps the lock came first, and he said, "Oh my God, I need to have this lock." No, yeah, that's interesting because I was working with them doing stuff. And I said, Hey, I can, I knew how he was really, really into lock strength. And I said, I can, and I had already been in 1993, I made my first uh, locking mechanism other than a lock back or a liar lock. Um, and I made quite a few. None of them were really good. Well, they actually, I've revisited some older ones now that I, I'm a little more skilled and I've made them work. But, um, and I approached Lynn and I said, Hey, I can build you it's like a really, really strong lock that's better, better. I use quotations better. You know, to be nice to people, mm-hmm. better, more durable than any liner lock, frame lock, or lock back. And so he said, "Yeah, let's do it." And that's that's how that happened. So that's a pretty cool story. So I just recently got the AD10 and the AD15. Uh, I'm a big fan of. I, I mean, I I look at my knife case and I got a lot of knives, but I think if I were to tally up 
I, I have probably the most Andrew Demko design knives and the most uh, Ernest Emerson design knives in my collection, <laughs> which is a cool, uh, to me, that's a, a good grouping to be in. Um, the AD15 to bed, the AD10 to wed. That's how I feel about it. I love them both. <laughs> one of them is super sexy, and the other one is is just a has solid character and a, a beautiful design, of course. Uh, I'm I'm a really really huge fan of these knives. I and, and I'm I'm grateful that you allowed Cold Steel to uh, to create such uh, high fidelity reproductions of these knives. What uh, inspired that specific collaboration? You know, I I just thought it was time to people. Emailed me and emailed me and asked me, "Hey, is Cold Steel ever going to make an eighty ten or an eighty fifteen? And I mean, I was relentless, and I thought, "Yeah, they should because you know it's going to be a lot the same, but a lot different, you know, price wise than mine." The AT fifteen is the MG, and it's six hundred seventy five dollars. It's it's a lot of money for uh, maybe not an enthusiast, but someone who wants something like that. It, you know, you're not really into it, but that's a lot of money, yeah. but. Almost everybody can afford a cold steel if you're disciplined. That is, you know. Yeah. I tell my buddies, you know, when I was an electrician, they're like, "Wow, your knives are expensive." I said, "If you don't go to the bar for three weekends, you can probably buy the knife." <laughs> and you have to quit chewing and smoking now. Right, you know? right. And so I mean, the, the money's there. I, there's just so many requests, and I, I did want, I did want to have more people uh, have the, especially the eighty fifteen, uh, have the chance to, to get one. So that's why, and you know. You mentioned they're they're really close to the the customs because you know all the all the CAD files that I design and use to build mine, I sent those files directly to the manufacturer. So there's only minor minor differences to to build those knives. That's what like mostly material, right? And then and then uh, the scorpion. Well, we'll talk about the scorpion lock, but I know the yoke is different. Uh, the way the whole the spring mechanism works in the in the cold steel yoke on the scorpion lock, it's a little different. Um, so let's talk about the scorpion lock. First of all, it's it's highly addictive uh, to play with, which you know is is not nothing. <laughs> there is there is something special about good fidget factor. Absolutely. But um, aside from that, the the whole blade profile I think is beautiful, and I love the flat grind and 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 the and the steep not the steep the uh, the shallow angle of the edge is really awesome. But tell me about the scorpion lock. You already had the triad lock, and it's the strongest lock going. What encouraged you to, to keep going and create the Scorpion lock? Well, you know, the main thing is that design is kind of, you know, not only my job, but it's my hobby. And I'm always thinking of, of, of uh, knife designs. And even though I, I promote heavily the triad lock, of course, and I say it's the best whatever because I designed it. It's a little biased. But um, you could make the argument that there is a, maybe an ideal lock per the knife design based on the intended use. You know, sometimes a frame lock might be more ideal than a than a, a trad lock or a lock back for whatever reason, your environment, whatever, where you really need an open, you know, like a Savenza, an open frame knife that doesn't get clogged up, right. doesn't, you know, fill up with gunk and that, you know. So there, there are some factors that, you know, I'm not saying that the trad lock is the be all end all lock for every single situation and um, use. But when I did this scorpion lock, I... All the things that pain me much, as I said before, I did a triad lock because I, you know, my turmoils with the frame lock and the scorpion lock came from the turmoils with making the triad lock. I was, I was getting ready for a knife show. It was the um, Ohio Classic Knife Show and I was working late. And at that time, all those parts were manually cut on the bandsaw and manually milled on little handmade fixtures and angles. And the tolerance in the triad lock to make that lock, you know how the lock sits flush with the top of the frame. Mm -hmm. It's it's five tenths, and what five tenths is is point zero 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 five, which is a half of a thousand. Now bear in mind, a piece of paper is four thousandths thick. So if you slice that piece of paper four times, that fourth one take that and divide that in half, and that's basically the five tenths. And if that rocker now, you can call it a lock bar, but we say rocker usually. If that rocker becomes five tenths off through bucking or just polishing, bang, it sinks in too deeply and you're, it's, you're, you're out of luck. And you don't, you don't have that solid flat surface across the spine that's so pleasing. To right. Yeah. Right. If it doesn't line up exactly, and it could be a little bit high, just a little bit high, but you can feel the texture of, of the jerking yeah. or whatever. But if it goes low, yeah, you're out of luck. And so I was getting ready for this knife show and I was making a few and it was just, you know, it was just horrible because 
you just polish and sand a little too much off and bang, you're, you're out of whack. And as I was falling asleep, I was laying down and I was like, man, that was a real son of a gun tonight. And I need to do something else. And then I started thinking of what, because the, it, it's that goofy flat angled radius lock face that fits in that blade tag. It's so unique and hard to reproduce through manual machining. Very easy on a wire EDM, but very hard with a bandsaw and a manual mill. Mm-hmm. So I thought, man, if I can somehow standard, I just need a pin that goes in there, like a dial pin, you know, because they're at, very accurate and they're readily made. And then I just, I kind of thought about that. I thought, man, if it just, if I just replaced that rocker with a something that had a pin in it, and that's what all the squirking is. It's basically like an inside-out lockback, you know, the squirking lock. Inside-out lock. Oh yeah, I see what right? you. Yeah, yeah. So I have a notebook by my bed. I have one by the couch and I just draw stuff and I drew it, kind of sketched it real quick. And then I went back to bed. And then after the weekend, I came, you know, the knife show, I came home and I thought, yeah, what about that? And I looked at that and I thought, wow, that should work. And then bang, I made it and it was, that was it. Did you make it pretty much just like how you drew it when you woke up in the middle? Yes. That's amazing. very, very much. And the, the scorpion lock has some unique angles in the, in the blade, in the tang where it sits. Mm-hmm. It's actually, it has this, like the triad lock, it actually has the curved face and a straight face. The same way I mentioned that rocker has that straight face and curved face. It has the same things, but in a negative image of it. So I, I know these features that help things stay in and help things have a self-adjustment just from making so many locks. And I was able to I kind of like, I would say I have like a, a large library of, of tricks, things that work and don't work from just experimenting with so much that it was pretty easy to just Bang, I just made it and it worked. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That is cool. It's like uh it's like a, a sudden discovery after twenty years, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it just it just fell fell together. So how does your design and R and D process change when you're designing for cold steel versus when you're designing for yourself in your own shop? That's a funny question. I usually design to Lynn Thompson's tastes. Because he has the ultimate say so. And I, you know, after working with him for so long, I know pretty much exactly what he likes, what he wants. Believe it or not, he doesn't like big overkill heavy stuff. <laughs> well, he's the one who came out with the linerless G10 first, I think. Well, that was, yeah, that was the first, the, the triads when we did that. Okay. Um, and that was because, see, the lawman, American lawman came out and it had steel liners, if you remember that. And through testing, we realized that the blade was breaking. The blade tang was breaking before the steel liner. And I'm like, well, I don't think we need these liners. So, because it had an eighth inch, eighth inch scales and then like 16th inch liners. Oh. And so, so the blade was breaking. I thought, well, let's, I was making some to test. And so we just did three sixteenths, you know, same, so it has the same overall thickness. And the blade still broke before the G10 because it's incredibly strong. Mm-hmm. And so well, we were like, well, why the hell do we need these steel liners? It adds weight and does not add strength. So to me, it's, it's a, it's a no brainer. You don't, why add weight and no strength and have a, a, a lesser strength to weight ratio? Well, that's, that's what keeps, um, a lot of the cold steel knives. I'm thinking of, of the recons and, uh, even the Espada G10 models. It keeps them slender. And, and these are, these are tactical knives that people, you know, I, I keep a, always have a broken skull. It's kind of slipped in my waistband, you know, just so that I never am without a knife. Right. That is a lightweight knife. And that, boy, we, cause we were always using three millimeter, you know, eighth inch, 3.1 is an eighth inch. We were always in eighth inch. And then Lynn's like, I need this to be lighter. I need this to be lighter. So took it down to two and a half millimeters. It's, it's really a slim, slim knife. Uh, he, he, I, I guess has um, a pretty sweet collection and I know he's a Kali man and he's a, he's a knife combative and he's, I know he's done everything in martial arts uh, as it relates to the blade. And I know his, he is unabashedly um, a uh, uh, knife is a weapon. A knife is a, is a totally valid self-defense option, you know, given, yes. pro- given proper training, restraint, Mature, thoughtful consideration, that kind of thing. You're an accomplished martial artist. Is it Aikido? Yes. So how does your martial mindset from the martial arts and your um, knife design, how do they intersect? What's the Venn diagram like? Are weapons, I mean, are, are knives purely weapons, purely EDC tools? Can two things be true at once? I would say both at once, but for me, more of a tool because, you know, I was a tradesman and stuff and I use a knife constantly. To, you know, electricians use a knife sometimes all day. In fact, when I was an apprentice, they said one of the 
skills were. If you showed up on that job site without a pocket knife, you got sent home. It was like, because that's, it's very, you know, this, you can do a lot with a pocket knife. Yeah, I wish my job said that. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> but at the same time, if you have a knife that works really well for whatever task you're doing, I would suggest to you that it would work really well in a self-defense situation. And the, the only differences would be, if, you know, if, if your blade's, you know, really broad, it might not stab well, which stabbing is, you know, the ultimate type of, type of finishing deal, really. Yeah. Because it goes through clothes, it goes through leather jackets and jean jackets and stuff. You know, people and people say to knife fighters, you know, I see guys at shows they pick up your knife and they do some like ninja moves and stuff. I'm like, I kind of giggle to myself, <laughs> you know. And then I see guys like on the on the other side of the token, they're like, yeah, this is a great outdoors knife, and I'll use this, you know, like like a survivor man type of deal. Right. And I'm like, well, and then I'm like, wow, this guy, how's he, when's he going to get in there? Where's he going to go in Alaska on a plane? And it's going to, he's going to be in an emergency survival situation. And I thought, wow, this guy's laughing at him because he tries to be a ninja and he tries to be a survival guy. And you both probably have basically the same, the same chances of doing either one. So you might not be in a survival situation. You're not like you're, you're commuting to work through, through a mountain pass. And you know, your right. car, and you have to build a shelter, build a fire. Yeah. But you might, you might have to defend yourself in a parking garage. Most right? definitely, yes. So yeah, I, I mean, I want a knife that can do it all. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I mean, I think that's, I, I, that was a loaded question. To me, it is both. It is, you know, I, I cannot find enough uses for my knife during the day because I would always love to be taking it out and using it. But it is definitely an EDC tool. But I also, you know, I'm, I'm. I've done Kali for a long time, so I'm totally unashamed about calling it a weapon. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If you're a martial artist, you're you're. Uh, it, it's a, it's a different breed. You know, a lot a lot of people are like just horrified by the thought that yeah, I'm carrying. You know, they think you're carrying a weapon. I'm like, we're talking about a weapon. I have to open boxes and stuff. And then other people are like, yeah, man, you could that might do some damage. It's just it's, it's it's odd that the the spectrum of um, I don't know, the way people see your knife or they see, you know, why, why you have that knife. Yeah. Yeah. This, this pen could do a lot of damage. This hammer could do a lot of damage. Yeah. So you mentioned in a recent interview that you have a milling machine that costs more than your first house. Uh, that was astounding to me. But being in the television production world, I know that small machines can cost an awful lot of money. Uh, talk a little bit about your shop, uh, which to me seems like a laboratory, which is totally cool. And tell me a little bit about, I know you work with another maker, right? Well, at, at, at my cold still shop, see, I have, I go to work in, in the daytime. Cold still has um, a building in town that it's the R&D for cold still, and uh, we do the cold still thing. And then I have my shop here at home, too, that actually my brother works at, running 80, 15 parts most of the day on the, you know, on the CNC mill here. That is cool. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's too much knives, but... Uh, really? I, I well, can't imagine I know, that. I don't but... know about that. Only when I have to grind all the hand grind, all the... You know, I'm like, hey, push the MGs, push the MGs. I don't want to grind these. So MG is machine ground. Just machine for anyone ground. Who's not, um, yeah. so that, that seems to be... Okay, I just saw an Instagram post you put up with you. You have a whole bunch of 80, 15 blades out, and you're like, I don't know if I should have taken all these oh. orders. Because that's a lot of hand grinding. That is a lot. You started doing the the machine ground blades with the eighty fifteen, not with the ten. Is that right? Yeah, we, we've never had an eight eighty tens that weren't hand ground. Okay, so the eighty fifteens were were just shooting off the map, I guess. And uh, so this is kind of your um, mid tech solution. That's a that's a, a term that's bandied about. But that I imagine just that simple act of getting the bevel put on there by a machine saves you a hell of a lot of time. Yeah, it's a it's a big difference in. We do, you know, everything in house is the same. The water jack gets done by a vendor here in, in uh, town. And then, you know, all the machining and all the fitting, finishing and everything ground and, and all the parts are actually, there's no difference between the MG and this custom other than either the blade steel or that it, the customs are hand ground. Hmm. Everything else is, is and to my mind, is still on the custom level because it, it's done out in my garage. It's in house. It's all handmade. Yeah. 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 And so, in, in trying to bring the price down, because again, the customs are really expensive, and I tried to get the price down by a couple hundred dollars by not having to grind blades. And I don't like grinding blades anymore. So it's hard work. Yeah, you mean the beveling part? The bevel grinding, yes, oh. yes, yes. Well, you know, there's there's like a hundred bucks in a blade by the time it's all purchased, cut, machined, and heat treated. And then if you mess up your bevels, it's like, oh man. And then you can mess them up, you know, a little bit out of whack. I've made maybe 
20 knives in in the last two years or so just kind of hacking around with a with a um i have a two by 42 craftsman you know grinder and it's just you know on the cheap big time just trying it out and uh edge bevel grind or just the bevel grinding is is uh uh still very 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 mysterious to me because i'll do one side and i'll i'll be thinking i have everything squared away i'm doing it all freehand and it'll look beautiful i'll flip it over and i'm like why do i suck on my left side or on my right side or whatever it is. So, <laughs> yeah it's always the way i can't imagine you know having a 800 dollars knife almost fully assembled and then and then having that weighing uh over my shoulders like an albatross and it's worse with a with a, a knife or a pulling knife because when your fixed blade's a little out of whack, there's there's nothing to reference it with. But when you close the knife blade, it has to run parallel with those liners, and you're looking for tip tip centering and stuff. It's just like you sell the knife, and you got you sell the guy a knife with a gauge basically to check your work, and it's you know so it's critically important to really be careful with that stuff. Have all of these um, knife collector pet peeves or 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 requirement? It's got to be a centered blade. That's something that that annoys me. If it's not centered, that that's, can be a deal breaker to me. But there there are all these little things that people look for uh, in knives now. And 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 I have a theory, and I I, I can't really test it because I don't know. But I have a theory that all of these particularities came along through social media slash YouTube from watching reviewers, which I do a lot of. Watching reviewers, I never really thought about a centered blade until someone started making a big deal about it. And I'm like, oh, yeah. From your experience and perspective, how has the knife world changed since you started making knives professionally? And how has customer input through social media, et cetera, had an effect? Uh, you know what? It, it's huge because now anybody can you know, take your knife and they can, whether it's their first review or their 50th review or 100th, they can do a review. They have a really big platform. You know, that the internet is just so amazing that, you know, you used to be able to, well, I don't know, but I mean, I assume you could sell a bad knife, send it to a guy and he's pissed at you. You never hear from him and, and no one hears from him. But now, as soon as you mess up, you know, you see him on Blade Form, this piece of crap, look at this. And it's, it's a, a really, it's a really critical market. It's a great equalizer, uh, in terms of the, the, uh, in terms of the customer. But yeah, I could see how things are, well, I guess I guess with any connoisseurship, no matter what it is, people are going to start looking deeper and deeper and deeper. It's just now there's a, a huge cacophonous you know, environment where you can go find out all of the problems with all of the knives you have. And I would imagine as a knife maker, you know, it, it requires you to constantly be improving. Yes, absolutely. You know, there's been times throughout my career that I've been, not very many, to be honest with you, but guys have complain about something and and it, it hurts you know i'm really like oh i can't believe like because i want everybody to be happy and i can't believe you know can't believe that whatever it ended up like that and but i will tell you this that and i was telling my brother this last night that every time that's ever happened it's probably it might only be three or four times in, in 15 years but still it's like oh man that's horrible but i've always then tried to specifically improve that not only for you know the fix this guy's knife but forever one time a guy and i don't know i don't even remember if it was exactly true but my edge wasn't sharp enough and i was like you gotta be shitting me i couldn't believe it you know i was free freehand uh you know putting the the cantle the cutting edge on and um it just wasn't sharp enough in one little spot i like, can't can't believe this it was like i got struck by lightning it was like so unexpected and so i bought like you remember the edge pro yeah the apex yeah, yeah the apex I, I bought like the master's kit of that and then i ended up with the uh the other uh um uh, the wicked edge and i bought you know every sharpening system there was so i would never ever ever hear your knife wasn't sharpened or completely sharpened or sharp enough well you you put so much time energy and you know creativity creative energy into the production of each knife that in a way it's a flaw in you not really of course but i mean you're investing so much into that knife if that knife isn't right you know well yeah that, that that's must why it hurts now, so right, bad Andrew? <laughs> yeah that's why it hurts so bad because you put so much into it and, and sometimes you you know you overlook something so uh we're gonna wrap this up in a second but i i gotta ask do you have any sort of stupid knife stories or or crazy stories from the shop or or don't even have to be that crazy just some an interesting anecdote from your years in knife making well you know 
I probably really don't now because typically my brother works in, in the daytime and I come up at night, so we're pretty secluded. But I can tell you, when I first started, my, my friend and I who works with me at Cold Steel, Mike Wallace, we've been making knives together since that seventh grade chisel forging. And uh, I remember the time that we, we would build forges and, and forge tomahawks and try to forge swords. Never were successful, ever, ever, ever. And um, I remember the time that some guy said, I don't, I don't know, we lost a lot from the metal shop lesson about we used 01, oil hardening tool steel. And uh, I don't know, we lost the thing about carbon steel. We just kind of, you know, forgot that. And some guys like, you need to use a good carbon steel, boys. So we're like, what, 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 what do you think? And there was this rotor tiller blades his dad had, you know, they're kind of like curved, like, and so, you know, we, we had no idea you should anneal it first and soften it before you flatten it. And so he smacked it, threw it, put it on the ground and hit it with a sledgehammer. <laughs> 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 and I wasn't there for this because I had just gone home. He hit it with a sledgehammer, and it bounced directly up and hit him right square on the forehead. Oh, my God. <laughs> and cut a big half-moon shape in his forehead. <laughs> and so he came over to my house because we're talking about flattening. I said, yeah, we can just flatten it. And uh, so he came over to my house like 10 minutes later, and he had a huge wealth and a huge bloody – like he looked like he got branded by like a – like a, I don't know, it's a weird moon thing. I'm like, what the heck is that? He's a roller tiller blade. <laughs> <laughs> so let that be a lesson. And, and, and Neil, you're still before you try to yeah. uh, change the shape of it. Yeah, I bet he didn't forget that one. No, he still has a scar, you know. 25, 30 years later, he still has a scar. Well, that's that's tough, and that's that's good street cred for a knife maker. Is he the is he the fellow who designed the um, immortal? He did. That's a cool knife. And is he Wallace Edge Tools? He is, yes. Awesome. Okay, so I've been following him on Instagram and not knowing that that he is who he is until this conversation. I'm putting it all together now. Oh, good. good. That's cool. Andrew, is there is there uh, anything else about knife making or your collection or or your career that I haven't asked that we need to know? The only big news is I'm working on another locking mechanism. I started the patent application. Actually, it's you know it's. I, I put the first half down for the patent, and I'm, I just got the, the rough draft of it. So I have to read through that, which I don't know if you've ever read patent language, but it's it's not the language that you and I speak. Right. And um, and so that will be pending. It'll be patent pending here probably within a couple of weeks. And then soon I'll debut another locking mechanism. Oh, man. Oh, man. I can't wait. I can't wait. So uh, how many other places have you announced this? This is it. You're, well, I, I did on Instagram. I said, "Hey, here's a here's a like a secret. I don't know what I said. Secret project or something." But, okay. All right. But well, yeah. This is this is it's going to be cool and it's going to be as different as you know the the scorpion lock is from the from the um, triad lock and even the ram safe. You know, I did that one for cold steel. That was on the mini bushman. Or on yes. The pocket bushman. Yeah, pocket bushman. Yeah. Unfortunately, those weren't as sweet as the handmade ones, but it's yeah, it's a pretty pretty good reliable knife. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm really excited about this this new locking mechanism, and all the complaints I have about the triad lock and the scorpion lock have now been solved with the newest one. So oh man, ever evolving. Oh man, okay, everybody listening, that's it. You just got an exclusive from Andrew Demko. There is a new lock on its way, and I cannot wait. And and um, so I will definitely. I I shoot uh, some videos on YouTube, and I will definitely definitely be snapping that up and showing it off when it comes. I already love it. I don't even know how to use it yet. And I think it's- You'll awesome. love it. You'll love it. <laughs> cool. Well, Andrew Demko, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And I got to say, it's been a pleasure collecting your knives over the years, the knives oh. you've had your hands on and, and now your own designs, which I am positively in love with. I can't, I can't tell if I like the 8010 or 15 better. I do like the, how the 8010 treats my pants better. That's about it. But that's, that's the most I can say so far. Yeah, you know, that's odd. Lynn chose, he doesn't like rough te textures, and he chose that rough texture on the 8015, which was odd. It feels so good in hand, the way it swells up down near your, you know, down below the uh, below the lock. It widens out in the hand, and it just feels so great. Anyway, sir, I could go on and on and on, but I want to thank you for coming on the podcast, and uh, I hope to talk to you again sometime. Great. It was my pleasure. I had a lot of fun. Have a question or maybe you just have a comment? Give us a call at 724-466-4487.
We'll answer your question on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. That number again, 724-466-4487. Welcome back to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Jim and Bob here with you. And Bob, uh, another notable in the knife world that Ah. you've had a chance to talk to. Yes, Andrew Demko. I mean, speaking to him, it really... uh, it really put in sharp relief what what hard work these engineers and designers and makers go through to give us these incredible products. I mean, I take for granted now how incredible the triad lock is. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm now experiencing the scorpion lock. And both of those things were obsessions to him. You know, they took him a lot of time, a lot of trial and error, a lot of uh, wasted materials. Well, I guess they're not wasted if you're learning. But, you know, he, he mentioned uh, you shave off one one thousandth uh, too much of that steel and the, the whole blade is going to rock and the whole thing is trashed. So to me, I have massive respect for someone who um, will, will, you know, is so into it that they will stick in there even when it gets so hard that you're dealing with thousandths of an inch. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, it's, pre- it's pretty incredible. It's a temperament I don't quite have yet. Temperament I don't have or a uh, skill that I don't have. So I, I, I really uh, can appreciate it, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, kind of dropping some news there on us, too. Yeah, I, I, well, I do believe uh, we delivered an exclusive Straight from Andrew Demko. He's got something else coming out. He's working on a third crazy patented lock. I guess it's patent pending now. And uh, I cannot wait to see what it is. Well, and that's the, you know, that's the kind of folks that uh, we're talking to here on the Knife Junkie podcast. And we appreciate you uh, you joining us for this, uh, this show, episode number 20. But if you have uh, not been with us since the beginning, we've had the chance to talk to a lot of folks already notable in the knife world, uh, like uh, YouTuber, YouTube star, uh, the Advanced Knife Bro that we had a chance to talk to back on episode number 12, uh, Laren Thomas from KnifeSteelNerd.com on 13, and another new YouTuber, Dr. Frunky on episode 14. Any thoughts about those couple of shows before I do some more name dropping, Bob? So we were seeing things from a different perspective on those shows, you know, uh, from the buyer's and uh, connoisseur's point of view. And, um, you know, like we spoke with Epic's Knuckle Bunny. He's another connoisseur. He's got taste that I don't have. But the decision making that goes into his knife buying still informs me. Oh, maybe these are some things I should be looking for, even though I'm not buying a $1,200 uh, knife. Maybe this one hundred dollar knife could be, you know, could feature some of the same things that I need to be looking for. Right, and Epic Knuckle Bunny was episode eighteen, and uh, also had uh, Rob Pennell for Snaggletooth MF. That's the Snaggletooth Tactical Company uh, back on episode sixteen, and another knife maker that you were looking forward to talking with. Uh, Les George, you can go to episode number seventeen and listen to those. And any of these numbers that I mention, just do the knifejunkie.com slash number. So for Les George. TheKnifeJunkie.com slash 17, and you'll go right to that show. And that was another great, great interview with a, with a great knife maker, an innovator, and a really down-to-earth guy. And more to come. Indeed. Indeed. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. For Bob, the Knife Junkie, DeMarco, I'm Jim Person. Thanks for listening, and join us again next week. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at ReviewThePodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.